right, so this is a typical matchup as well. Overpair versus two undercards. Even when we're suited, you know, we're again pretty much in a overpair underpair situation. Uh, just to, again, proof <laughs> that I'm not just uh, coming up with this nonsense. Again, it's you know more or less 80-20 split. Okay. So jack of spades, ten of spades, we hold versus an overpair of queens, right? And pre-flop, we're only at 19% equity if we're to push right now. Flop comes, however, and we hit our jack plus two spades, okay? So we, we connect with the board, we do have top pair, but we also have the flush draw to boot. Now, the queens are, of course, still good here, right? They're still, they're still a better hand. However, we have, in this case, two outs for the other jack, which will definitely help us out, <laughs> give us trips versus the queens, and the full nine, the full nine for, um, for the flush draw, all right? What else do we have? We also have the three tens, right? So in this case, we're gonna have 14 outs. 14 outs, so two jacks, three tens, and basically the full nine, full nine spades for 14 outs, hence our coin flip all of a sudden on the flop. Now, let's say a 12 out example is actually what we're looking for. That's a 14er versus an overpair, right? And you're also even money on the flop. So how about this one, guys? Another very key match uh, matchup, anytime there's a pair, even a pair of queens, if I have one overcard, I'm gonna have about 30% equity to the river just given that one overcard, pre-flop. So another good principle matchup here. All right, flop comes and we hit our middle pair and the flush draw and we think that the ace may still be good. Wow, look at that. All right, so we give ourselves the full, the full nine, right, because we're gonna have the nut flush here. Uh, if, it, if a spade does come, and we think that anytime we hit our six, it's also going to be good, and in this case it would be, given us trip uh, sixes. All right, so it's two for the sixes, three for the aces, and again, nine for the flush draw. And yeah, in this case, we're looking at 51%. Very, very good. <laughs> okay, and finally we get to our 12 outer. All right, pre flat matchup with the 98 suited versus an over pair of queens is again right at 80-20%. Flop comes, five, six, two two suited. Okay, so we've got essentially the inside straight draw for the seven plus not nine outs for the flush in this case, rather eight because one of our sevens is also a spade. In essence, 12 outs and right here again it's a coin toss um, with the inside straight draw and the flush draw again for 12 outs. And you guys can play with this here in Poker Stove and, and you know, look at different matchups. You can also of course and you should always look at actual entire ranges you know, this guy being on, you know, whatever we want to give him as a full range and then see see how you match up on the flop versus that entire range. And actually, in this case, you're better versus an entire range, not knowing exactly his holding. So, yeah, again, this is 12 outs, inside straight draw and the flush draw. If you think you're flush and inside straight would then be good. And yeah, that's what you're, that's what you're looking at, guys. And again, I would, I would recommend playing with this a uh, bit, but in general... Over pairs versus under pairs and 80-20 split equity wise. Uh, any one over card versus a middle pair is then going to give you at least 30% to the river. Um, over cards versus under cards very often a 60-40 split. And yeah, that's pretty much how it works out. But of course you're playing again against full ranges that we covered in the first video and also bid here. So back to the story here. We've got tips and tricks number three. Last point at the low stakes, guys, and I played a lot at the lower middle stakes and uh, pre-flop four bets from big stacks and again I've, I've made a qualifier here big stacks right from small stacks um, yeah it totally depends if they're a small stack pro or small stack fish but especially from big stacks even from late position it's very often gonna be queens a better ace king at again the low stakes at least maybe the middle stakes and yeah just have that in your minds Four bets, you know, a lot of guys are gonna raise and maybe flat. Uh, some guys are gonna re-raise and then flat um, with a wider range, but you're rarely gonna see this re-re-re-raise for four bets and five bets without this kind of range. It, I mean, it happens sometimes, but it, yeah, it's gonna get wider the, the better your player is, but in general, at the low stakes, expect this on any given four or five bet especially. <laughs> 
and yeah, then you just need to look at your um, your equity matchup versus entire ranges, and you can do the math and and figure out if it's a good call based on your pot odds. So in the blinds, guys, tips and tricks for, and we are coming quickly to a close. <laughs> not so quickly, maybe. Um, do not click the auto fold button. All right, I already mentioned that in the first video. In general, in general, if you are in the blinds, uh, re-steal three bet a lot, right, as a squeeze, um, especially. And again, here, if you do get flatted versus your squeeze by one opponent, you want to make a C bet of about at least eighty percent on almost all high board flops. In general, again, guys, general tips, general recommendations. Don't quote me on this one. Uh, it's always context based. It's always opponent based. Um, always history based. If you know, you, if you know your players, um, if you're able to use stats, of course, your your heads up uh, displays. Then that's a huge, huge determining factor in what you can squeeze and what you can see that after the fact. But in general, if you're going to be playing pretty much a, a statistically blind game that we'll be playing here at the Storm Cash Tables for now. Uh, essentially, yeah, not having a stats program that's that's functional for that for that play, then I would recommend in general, you know, if you do squeeze and get flatted, go ahead and pop it. Eighty percent of all flops in general, uh, hit or miss. So once again, here many players at the storm tables are very tight, and I would say steal from the cut off the button or the small blind with a much wider range than your typical ring game. Um, Steel ranges in general. Uh, be careful. Be very careful when you are looking at a mid stack player in the small or the big, because they can re-steal push with that stack size very effectively. And if you're not able to call that down, then you might be in a really tight spot. So also, if somebody's stealing into you, right? One of these tight players are stealing then into you. They're raising, and you're in the blinds know that your implied odds are going to be quite a bit more than a typical ring game very often if they are the tighter storm player that they were talking about here because post flop when you hit it's very unlikely that they're going to let go of a top pair or an over pair so again in the blinds win the big stack stealer four bets versus your re-steal okay so let's say there's an open raise from the cutoff you're in the small blind, you three bet it as a re-steal. And then this person in the cutoff, four bets. Right, so raises over the top. So initially he raises, you re-raise, he re-re-raises, right? He four bets. Or she four bets. And very often this is gonna be tens or better ace queen, about four point seven percent, maybe even jacks are better ace king. Alright. In general, again small stakes small stakes play. Alright, your ace queen from the small versus the initial range of 4.7 is only 37.8% to the river. <laughs> and even worse, at 32% equity to the river versus Jack's a better ace king. So tens, let's say you're holding tens in the same spot versus the exact same ranges, uh, four bet ranges for your opponents there. And tens only have 40% versus a tens are better ace queen range and about 34% versus Jack's a better ace king. So the big question of the hour is, do you have the pot odds uh, needed to break even? And that's, yeah, that's the big, big question of the hour, and that's what I want to use our pot odds calculator for to illustrate a few things also concerning total ranges that your players could be, um, could be using and how your respective hands hold up versus those ranges. All right, so this is my baby here. This is the pot odds calculator I put together. Um, brief overview this portion of the calculator is for direct pot odds in one card this portion is then for when you shove over the top and we'll get into that shortly this is an expected value calculator for shoves either pre or post flop underneath we've got an entire yeah, calculator specifically for steals and underneath we have something that's really really useful and this is basically bluff success the respective calling odds that your villains are receiving when you make certain pot proportional bets and again an attempt to steal percentage of your of your opposition and what you can effectively re-steal push with with short stacks and if yeah the respective range of that entire set of hands uh, really useful stuff but we're not going to get into the details there um, all we're going to do right now is look at a couple of 
scenarios for pot odds and especially pot odds versus these small stack mid stack players that I've been actually seeing all over the place at the NL20 storm table. So here's a scenario. Small blind is 10 cents, big blind is 20 cents. I'm on the button and I raise it up to steal. Typical 3x raise, so I raise it to 60 cents, namely three big blinds. And the player in the big blind raises it up to 1.6 dollars. All right, so he basically raises it to a total of nine big blinds. So he's already posted 20 cents, and then he raises it up another eight big blinds, making it a total of nine for his total raise. And that gives me then the decision if I should call the 120 on the 250 pot, right? So I'm calling the 120 here, and if I just want a flat, being on the button, and then play this guy post flop, then I'm going to need basically uh, two to one odds, more or less, and 32% equity to break even if I were to call all in for the 120. All right, I'm not, so I'm going to need this percentage chance of hitting a playable or profitable flop. And as you guys well know now that you've seen this theoretical video, if I'm holding ace-x, or ace-king, say, I'm going to hit either the king or the ace about that amount of time. Right? And that's, that's fine for, for playing on if I'm only playing hit or miss poker. I've, of course, also got post-flop lines of play where I can push my opponent off his or her hand. So this is to be taken in light of all your different options post-flop, if you're not going all in pre. All right. Now, my effective stack size, because I raised it up, right? I made this deal raise of 60 cents or three big blinds, is now, if I buy in for 20 bucks at 1940, what the rest of this calculator shows you is that if I were, you know, if this guy basically, he re raises. So he three bet re steals. And I don't only have the option to call, but I also have the option to, yes, four bet and even four bet push if I choose. What this side of the calculator shows you is including the rake, right? That's with the rake is the respective percentages underneath. And what I can do here is then shove. And if I do shove, the opponent needs 45% equity to call me all in and break even in the long run. All right, or 46, basically 47%, including the rake pot. And so if I shove for the 1940, the total pot, if one villain calls, just one villain, the V here, will be 40-10, right, because it's the big bet, um, or, yeah, the big blind player that then re-steals. Very good. If I push for 1940, basically my remaining stack, I'm going to need, and this guy does call, I don't think he's ever going to fold, right? I'm going to need 48% equity to break even in the long run, and just over, you know, just under 51%, including the rake. So um, what does that mean for me in the actual moment, right? If Again, I steal raise to 60 cents. He re-steals, he three bets from the big blind to 160. My call is here, 120. I can either flat or I can four bet or I can four bet shove. So guys, in order to figure out what your total equity is versus your opponent's total ranges, first of all, you have to put your opponent on a range. So if I think my opponent is three betting only with nines are better or ace queen and I'm holding a pair of eights right here so basically my equity versus his entire range is only 35.6 percent and we just saw that if he does flat and he's never gonna fold that I need 50 percent equity uh, shoving for 100 big blind stacks now if I'm on ace king offsuit and I put the guy on the same range all of a sudden I've got 48.7 percent equity to the river so the yellows are basically marginal spots uh, given the rake. The green should be good to go uh, even with the rake. Right? So your, your hand basically here versus your opponent's total range that you estimate. And you know this is also a really cool table. Um, you know, if you see a guy playing 3%, you can assume that this is more or less his, his range of cards. This 3% can be markedly different. It does not have to be jacks or better or ace king, but it very often is. The wider you get, the more the actual holdings can change. Okay, he's raising 12%. What is that if I just go to the default? Looks like this. Hence, <laughs> more or less this range. And then I say, actually, you know, this guy's a little wild, uh, wilder. Yeah, something like this. So. 
All right, so you know this is a markedly different range than what we just had, at more or less the same percentage, and it could be quite a bit different versus our versus our tens here. So yeah, we're at sixty percent against that entire range, and if we just give them the default again, all right at twelve eight ish. Yeah, that changes a bit, right? So I mean, it depends completely on the holdings within your opponent's range, within that percentage that you're giving them. But yeah, by and large, I think this is a really good table. This is a general orientation uh, that you guys can check out and yeah, use as you like. And we go back then to you know the initial question: Do we have the equity needed to make that call? <laughs> well, you got to be right about the ranges, and you got to be right about your pot odds, and that's what this calculator is for. Now, what I'm seeing a lot, as I mentioned a few times, is a lot of um, you know small and mid stack players. So the effective stack is not going to be 1940 here. Right? It's not going to be my effective stack, rather the stack of the small stacker or the mid stacker. So post flop guys, we're going to play small pots out of position and with small hands, i.e. top pair, top, or top pair good kicker or over pairs. We're going to play big pots in position with big hands and it's going to be two pair or better or with big nut draws, right? 12 plus outs as we had gone into pretty great detail. Uh, they're in poker stove with and we're gonna look at here top pair good kicker and over pairs as generally a quote-unquote good hand not in our minds a big hand okay and again this is highly dependent on the pre-flop betting action if you're in a four bet pot and you've got ace king and you do happen to flop the ace you can consider yourself pretty good on most flops no doubt um, you know, <laughs> barring guys that, that four bet or three bet light and then flat four bets uh, light with any pocket and so to connect stuff like that also exists. So again, guys, always a context dependent decision. What we got then post flop is of course the flop, the turn and the river. And what I've got here is on the flop, consider shoving your monster draws, right? As I showed you guys already in poker stuff a few times, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse there, but just know whenever you're doing better than 12 outs are better and you think they're all clean outs on the flop, you're at least flipping in, in most scenarios against entire ranges and very often you're, you're quite a bit ahead. Plus uh, you have an amazing amount of fold equity when you do shove those flops. So yeah, both short stack, mid stack and big, big stack, those flop shoves are with your draws, with your monster draws, yeah, really good idea from time to time. All right, and here we have the turning point and the big question of the hour of course on the turn is am I Am I involved in this pot for the long haul or not? So it's a yes or no question. Not always, but very often on the turn, it is the turning point. And yeah, you need to ask yourself, do I really want to make this call? And if I do, am I willing to call another big bet on the river? Uh, if I'm making this call for hit or miss poker, right? I make my call on the turn, do I have the odds to do so and make money in the long run? All right, the biggest question, <laughs> biggest question here, uh, post flop play is very often on the river, ironically enough. And this is where I see a lot of guys, especially novice and rec players, make some big mistakes. And that is they bet when they can only get called with a better hand, even in position. So what I want you guys to start doing is when you're on the river, ask yourself, right? Don't just play robotically. Ask yourself. If I make this bet, can they call me with a weaker hand? If they can't, opt for the cheap showdown, especially when you're in position. Uh, don't better raise it. And if, if somebody checks to you on the river, this, this question should be the only question in your mind. If I now bet this after his check, can he call me down with a weaker hand? If he can't, check. Because when you bet, he's only going to fold. <laughs> now, if if he can only call you down with a stronger hand, what are you doing? You're setting yourself up for a check raise, right? So one of two things is going to happen. You're going to, you know, your opponent checks into you. You bet, but she can't, she can't call with a weaker hand, so she folds. All right? Your, your opponent checks. Uh, you have the idea that, um, that she could call with, uh, with, with weaker hands, but... Right, you're not so comfortable with your own hand. Maybe you're only on top pair or some kind of weakish hand, and you're making a value bet after she checks, right? And then you get check raised. 
huge, maybe all in. So you're sitting there now with your marginal hand that you could have seen a cheap showdown with, and maybe even won, and you get check raised out of your seat because you're playing a savvy, a savvy player, and she just check raised you uh, into next week, right? And you're sitting there with your marginal hand, and you gotta lay it down. So again, this is this is the big question: Can they call me with a weaker hand? If the answer is yes, on the river and you're in position, you can make that value bet. You can try and extract value. If the answer is no, they cannot call me with a weaker hand. They're only going to fold when you make the bet anyways. And then again, the third option, I guess, uh, is the example that I just gave you of check raise bluffs or check raises also for value where you're sitting there completely lost in space <laughs> with your marginal or bare top pair hand. So again, top pairs over pairs on the river, you're in position, yeah. You don't get greedy. I mean, not always. You know, you do want to maximize value as often as you can. But especially at the low stakes, you know, if they can't call you with a weaker hand, don't bet it in general. Not always, but in general. So with that, guys, I think we'll look at maybe one or two other example hands uh, just to bring home a few of these points. Also look at um, some hands where, yeah, I experienced already some very extreme variants. And yeah, just to be honest, you know, and uh, show you guys also not just huge hands that we that we only won, but also hands that we that we lost big with. And yeah, that's that's poker, guys, and that's definitely going to happen. And again, that's why you should always adhere to bankroll management. So case in point, we wake up with aces here in the cutoff, and action starts. Fold, fold. We raise it up. We four times the big blinds. So we four x betted here. And again, my open raises are going to vary between three and four big blinds. All right, player on the button just cold calls. It just flats it. Small blind fold, big blind folds. And this is, again, guys, a mid-stack player. And always have a quick look around your table to see where that six around six buck guy is or gal. All right, the rest of us are then big stacked here at 100 big blinds plus. All right, and this guy has 200 big blinds in his stack effectively after that flat. So... The effective stack now in this pot is mine. Okay, so we've got basically 122 big blinds left. And yeah, that's what we're playing with right now. So this is deep stack play, a big deep stack play effectively. And I've got my aces here on a rainbow board. And it is the 8, 3, 10. So somebody flatting with a 9 jack, 9, 7 maybe suited could be there. And of course, in my mind, I'm looking at any flat as being a pair of threes, basically any pair of twos to a pair of tens which completely covers that set mining range, right? And so most novice players are sitting here thinking, oh sweet, I've got my overpair of aces. And I was also thinking, okay, sweet, yeah, I've got my overpair of aces, but I'm not thinking, well, now I'm gonna shove, right? I'm very worried with this hand. I'm happy, but worried. And that's what good players are when they have their overpairs like this on these small boards. So I definitely make my C bet on the flop and get flatted again. <laughs> so player flats me, pre-flop flats me again, and what happens here is what could be considered a float. I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't explain it. So if I don't bet, if I just check this, and then he bets it, that's a float. So basically he, he floats me into the turn, so to say. I bet the flop, he flats it, turn comes, I check, he bets. The other float option in position is I bet and he... Okay, in this case, he only flats again, but that the float move would then be a raise. All right, so you have both options at your disposal. And so he only flats me again on the turn. So here comes the river, and I'm thinking, you know, okay, maybe he's on, you know, um, ace-10. Maybe he was on the nine-jack. Um, maybe he's on, yeah, ten-jack, stuff like this, and will pay me off. Um, maybe he's on a weak king, maybe he had, uh, let's say here, uh, jack king or king queen or something like that. And in my mind, I, I see a lot of hands here, a lot of weaker hands he can pay me off with. So I go ahead and make a so-called triple barrel, right? It's uh, basically continuing my aggression on every single street, pre-flop, on the flop, on the turn, and now on the river. I make that triple barrel c-bet here for about half pot and get raised. So he didn't min-raise me here, but it also wasn't a push. And 
and I'm sitting there thinking, damn, I could actually fold this. Um, and and in, this, in this moment, I actually wanted to fold it. The question on the river concerning pot odds is not, of course, what your draw is or what your equity is in relation to the pot odds. That's, that's not what you're asking yourself. What you're asking yourself here with your calls is the following. I'm getting pot odds of 3.67 to 1. Namely, I need 21% 20, equity to break even in the long run. But on the river, of course, the equity is done with. It's either 100% or 0% or uh, a split. So what, yeah, what we're looking at here is, am I going to be able to make this call one time essentially in five and be correct? If I think I have a better hand in this, in this scenario, more or less one time in four, one time in five, I make that call. If I don't, if I think I'm beat more than that, then I got to lay this down. Right, and I thought my aces were still good here. And just to show you guys, just to follow up on that idea of flat calls on the button, you know, I lost a full hundred big blinds right here, a full stack with aces versus a flop set. And actually, I didn't overplay it, right? I just, you know, I, I could have potentially then checked the river and save that extra extra cash. But you know, I yeah, I opt for the triple barrel here and get shoved in my face, right? That's that's an option also to fold. I could have also made what's called a block bet, which would be maybe betting about 25% or maybe a third of the pot instead of half of the pot. That's also a good idea in a lot of cases here where you're marginal. And guys, this is very marginal <laughs> uh, in a lot of cases, right? And so, yeah, our way ahead, way behind. And yeah, in this case, we were definitely way behind and could have theoretically found a fold there. Could have, right? It would have been pretty weak play, but I think the, the best move would have been to bet a bit smaller here on the river or simply not bet at all, just check call. Basically, you know, thinking that he's not going to pot it, but, you know, maybe make the same amount of a half pot bet into me, and then I have the same result in the long run. When I make that bet and he comes over the top, then I lose all that extra, all that extra cash. So different ways you can play that, guys, but again, you know, aces losing versus tens. And now I'll just show the cards and show you what the equity matchup was pre-flop again, 80, 20 split more or less. Flop comes and look at that. Over pair of aces, rainbow board. I've only got 9% equity to the river. So here we pick up the ladies and raise it up in the cutoff. And that's again, guys, a steel raise because it is a raise from late position. And here we're playing five-handed, it looks like. And this guy on the button now didn't flat, but he, I two bet, he three bets. Fold, fold, and I, four bet, okay? So again, two bet, three bet. I'm getting more or less two to one odds to make that call. So I could just flat here with the queens, look for a non-king or ace flop, and then get active on the flop, or I can four bet, giving him now with my race size two and a half to one odds, and he needs right at 28% to break even. He sees that I like my hand, and as a deep stack player, he then shoves for a five bet. That's a five bet. <laughs> so the effective stack is right here at 26.7. Or the effective pot, right? Because he has me covered. Good. So my effective call is more or less, again, two to one. And at this point, I only need 34% to break even. So if he's on ace, king, ace, queen, any other ace, um, I'm good. If he's on um, yeah, five bet, maybe lighter range of eights or better, Right, then I'm also very good, and again, guys, please don't take my word for it. <laughs> Let's go ahead and give this guy a range of eights or better, and ace king and ace queen suited maybe for a show if you're a five bet versus a guy that he thinks he can outplay, and that's about 4.7 percent, more or less, and that might be a bit wide. Um, Yeah, again with five bets here, low stakes, we don't know. But against that entire range, I'm at forty or fifty-nine percent equity with my queens. So of course I call because I only need thirty-four percent to break even in the long run. Because I am going all in. Let's tighten that up. Let's put him on Jacks are better, ace king, right at three percent. And even there, my queens are at forty seven percent, so I'm still good for that flat, right? Now, let's say he never he only plays 
aces or ace or queens or maybe the ace king suited here as a five bet shove. Super tight. And there it gets, yeah, really funky at 28%, but even then I'm only losing the difference, right? So right around 6% I drop in the long run versus that entire really, really tight range. And so I do call that, but there are of course other ways to play that. Namely, I two bet, he three bets, I got queens. I can also flat, right? Like I just said, wait for the nine ace or king board and then get active. But I go ahead and say, yeah, I think this guy's five betting me light here. He was a winning player, so I put him on more of a savvier range, right? And I get in with queens. Flop comes, nine, seven, ten, monotone board, so three suited. And there's a fourth heart, and I'm thinking, damn, that's probably it. And there's a ten. All right. And what happened? He takes it down with exactly the same hand. And this is what I want to show you guys. This is called variance. And this is the brutal mathematic <laughs> truth of poker from time to time. Uh, let's show his cards. And this is a complete coin toss at 50-50, right? The only thing that can happen here is basically running diamonds, running any suit for the flush to, yeah, to break that tie. So we're right at effectively 50-50% um, equity-wise here pre-flop when we get it all in. So that means we should actually be, should be splitting this pot basically 9.999999 times in 10. And all of a sudden, my equity goes from 50% to 32, and here comes a fourth heart and I'm toast. All right, that's variance, guys. That is going to happen. Be ready for it. Always adhere to bankroll management. All right, and the final example hand that I want to show you guys, because I think it is a good... A good learner, good educational hand here for a lot of, a lot of reasons is the following, and then we'll jump into our live session. All right, so action starts under the gun folds. Middle position raises it up three x. It's a good raise size. We then flat for dramatic pause. Yes, set set value. All right, we're looking for that third three, and of course we're setting ourselves up here for a squeeze from any of these players who then would maybe three bet it, raise it up. But we're okay with also flatting and then flatting a three bet because we're playing here big stacked and everybody behind us is also big stacked, the only mid stack players over here. Good, so this guy then over flats, over cold calls, and both the blinds fold out. And we actually hit our set this time, right? So that's gonna happen how often, guys? <laughs> right, one time and eight and a half, so 7.5 to one against. And very good. This guy checks. Now, what is his board texture? It is rainbow, three different suits. However, it is relatively connected. So this guy who opened raise may be looking for a check raise here, um, which would be good for me since I've hit my set. The thing is, when he checks, the open raise of checks, I wouldn't check behind if I didn't have a player to my left who can still raise it up. So I think this check is in enticing this guy to actually bet in position, to make a positional bet. So I check behind, right, with my flop set, and we know how strong that is now. And unfortunately, he checks, you know, after after both of our checks. The other reason I check here is because I think both of these guys could well be on over cards, and that they haven't hit yet, right? So I'm giving, with my check, I'm also giving these guys a chance to hit something here on the turn of the river, and then pay me off later because they might not do it now if they're not on an overpair. So good. Flop, our turn comes, and it's just a perfect card for us, right? It's now a completely, completely rainbow board, all four suits, and there's only a bare ace here. And so, yeah, we could be on flopped, you know, or looking at a flopped overset of sevens or fours here. Highly unlikely, by the way. Um, that's for another video, but if you flop a set and you get, uh, get into it with a guy who has a better set, or a girl, then you know, just say good hand. It's just so unlikely. So don't, yeah, don't even worry about it. Really, don't even worry about it. But what we were worried about a little bit was that maybe you know this guy overcalling with a 56 of you know some kind. Uh, you know, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so, anyways, the ace comes and we're thinking, okay, fantastic. One of these guys definitely has the ace, and let's see what happens. So this player, right? He was the pre-flop aggressor, the first person to come into the pot. He raised it up three times, and he makes now what's called a delayed continuation bet. So he didn't bet the flop, but he bets the turn for a delayed C bet. And I think, fantastic, now I really want to suck this dude over here in as well, right? So I only flat. 
many cases, if this is a two-suited board, I'm going to raise it up directly to knock somebody out who is on that 56 or any kind of two hearts. So in this case, because of that third player, I only flat trying to get him in this time. And yeah, clever little booger. He yeah, he checks and then folds out. And then here comes here comes the turn. Oh, forgive me, the river. And so now it is a paired board. And I'm thinking, yeah, if he's on the A7, we just got royally screwed. <laughs> uh, if he's on a set of fours, yeah, then of course that was just a bad beat. Um, and if he's on just the bare seven, let's say the 78, then we're looking really, really good. If he's on any ace, we're looking really, really good, right? Because now we got a full house, so three's full of sevens here. And I'm putting him probably on any kind of H jack or better. So let's see what happens. Now he makes one final value bet, thinking he's good here and that I'm not on the seven. And I, of course, raise that up. And I don't shove here because uh, I don't want to scare him, right? And again, it's kind of what the same guy, uh, the guy earlier did to me. You know, I raise that up about three times so that, you know, he can call it. And it could be theoretically a bluff. Uh, some guys will go ahead and shove that to give the idea that they are bluffing. Um, but, yeah, I just opted for the 3x raise with a bit of change here behind. And he bet calls. And we take that down, and he shows us the expected ace queen. And yeah, this is yeah a different way that you guys can play your hands. Um, you don't want to slow play it like that if this is a two suited board or a highly connected board. Um, but yeah, that's that's an example of a slow play, and also playing such that theoretically the guy behind you could also contribute to the pot. So yeah, different different things at your disposal, guys, and all of the example hands that will be. Um, or well, actually the live hands that will be playing now uh, at the Storm Tables will cover all these all these concepts as we move forward and um, I think with this theoretical background you guys have seen pretty much everything you need to see in order to get the, the maximum benefit from all the, the real-time sessions to follow and as promised we won't jump directly on four tables right we're not going to drop you into a uh, a Mavericks break we're gonna we're gonna paddle out with a nice long board uh, Two foot swell, three foot swell tops. Uh, you know, get to get to know the motion of the ocean. Uh, get our bearings. Get some experience, right? Um, maybe get the misclick stuff like that out of the way, and then take it from there, right? We'll move up then after the session to two tables, and only then will we get into the four table full on session. So again, this is Dylan for MyBet.com. Wishing you all the best, and definitely best of luck at your next storm table.